children's entertainment, there's a whole slew of material to sort through. Some of it is educational, meant to guide the mindset of the next generation. Others are less cerebral, more... entertaining, if that's the right word. There's a fine line some filmmakers struggle to find between engaging the young audience and actually providing good information to them. This demographic already spends much of their lives being schooled and told how to do things, so the last thing producers want is for their movie to feel like another lesson. However, going too far in the mindless entertainment direction leads to parent rejecting it as unsuitable, wrong, downright stupid and a waste of everyone's time. You be the judge. There are kids' films that master this tightrope walk, and I've already reviewed a few of them. But this year the genre added another jewel to its crown. Disney's Inside Out. Intended for children, Inside Out is about the human condition and personifies emotions in a way the audience can relate to. Since its demographic is under 14, they left out the darker and more complicated things like every emotion ever in Game of Thrones. I originally planned to do this review in the spring, around the time the film won an Oscar for Best Animated Feature Film, but I had to put it on hold for... reasons. What? Final episode? What? Where have I been? Who knew about this? Why didn't they tell me? I got an episode from that surprise, so it's all good. Anyway, Inside Out initially made a huge splash with critics and fans, but now that some time has passed since its debut, some have started to critique its message, stating that it oversimplifies the human condition given the girl's age. The question I posit is the first one I pose about children's films. Is this one mostly informative? more entertaining, or is it truly the perfect balance that fans claim it to be? Well, let's go into the mind of an 11-year-old girl and see what we find. And thank the stars that they chose an 11-year-old girl, not a 13-year-old one. Meet Joy, our resident Type A personality. She's there from the very moment that Riley, our protagonist whose emotions are on display, gains consciousness. She has one goal in life, keep her human happy. That's a simple task at first. Babies are always happy, right? Just Riley and me? Oh, for 33 seconds. For every peak, there must be a valley. Joy's is named Sadness. She's the other emotion that's been around as long as Joy, but does not wield the same kind of respect. Anger, fear, and disgust all seem to default to Joy's lead, even if Sadness gives a different stance. Hell, at one point, Joy puts Sadness in a circle just so she'll stop touching things and keeping her influence away from the core memories. See, the mythos of Inside Out states that core memories are defining moments that remind us who we are. Even when other things try to shake us, those internal things that we hold dear, they will remind us of everything that we should be. It's kind of an interesting concept, and when I think about it, there are turning points in my life that I remember, but... The plot makes this into the be-all, end-all, and its climax depends on you mo knowing these core memories are vital, so don't you forget them. Ha! Sorry. Riley has all happy memories for her core, all the best times cherished. But when her family moves across the country from Minnesota to California, she has trouble adjusting to, well, everything. She eventually has an embarrassing breakdown in the classroom due to sadness overwhelming her, and... Oh. It's a core memory. But it's blue. <gasps> no, wait! Stop it! No! Ah! No! It's not just Joy that's panicking either. The way the movie builds this scene, the audience too is like, no, this can't happen. It's a bad thing that this sadness is going to get into her core. The first time watching, I felt the same way. It's kind of strange. That's due to your cultural conditioning. Anthro! Where have you been? Oh, I just finished my cross-country lecture tour. Made for one fun summer, I can tell you that. Lecture tour? Here, let me show you. Here's my Mount Rushmore performance, where I spoke at length about American politics becoming a cult of personality. Wow, cool. It was. I even took a crowd selfie. Well, that's, uh, that's a lively bunch you have there. Yes, she followed me on the entire tour. Really big fan of my work, that one. I'm sure she is. By the way, what did you mean by cultural conditioning? Oh, yeah, yes, that. Americans live in a society where happiness has been rebranded into the end goal emotion for everyone. Therefore, anything that gets in the way of happiness you react to with negativity. I'd like to think no one wants a child to be focused on a sad memory as one of their core aspects. But people are defined by not only what they experience, but how they get through it. Most films show a character's journey, where someone starts as a distinct personality and changes through the course of the trials they face in the plot. 
There's happy moments, sad times, frustrations and inconveniences, and even tragedy that shaped the journey. It's the existence of these hills and valleys that make the movie an experience for the character. Hey, real life offers that same path, just without all the explosions. Yes, but how people take in these experiences shape what they learn from them. Social researcher Hugh Mackey said in his book The Good Life that Western societies almost suffer from a communal fear of sadness, where looking on the bright side is the only option. Come on, we're not that obsessed with happiness. Then why did an article in the scholarly journal of happiness studies discover a strange trend where not all countries value happiness as much as America does? Journal of what? Happiness studies is a whole academically accepted branch of this beast. In the 2014 article it says, and I quote, One of these cultural phenomena is that, for some individuals, happiness is not a supreme value. It continues by saying, many individuals and cultures do tend to be adverse to some forms of happiness, especially when taken to the extreme, for many different reasons. Some of their beliefs about the negative consequences of happiness seem to be exaggerations, often spurred by superstition or timeless advice on how to enjoy a pleasant and prosperous life. Oh, that's concerning. Sounds a bit like joining a cult, doesn't it? Kind of. If you assume that when people say happy, they actually mean happy. Surveys asking, are you happy with our customer service? Really mean, are you satisfied with it? Girlfriends asking, are you happy with that tone in their voice? You should probably answer quickly if you hear that, by the way. They're really saying, do you want to keep dating? It's shorthand for doing well, being positive. Then explain this. Why are there so many self-help books? Because people want to be happy more often than sad. And there are those that will take advantage of that. That's actually a good point. It's so good, I might steal that for my next tour. I'll call it Hunting Happy. I have to see if Six Flags in Disneyland are booked. Good luck with that one. So in Joy's panic, she accidentally ejects all the core memories in order to keep the sad one at bay, which upsets sadness and creates more conflict. During this confusion, they accidentally sent all the core memories as well as Joy and Sadness down to long-term memory storage, removing their influence on Riley completely. Here's where the film shows the importance of emotions working in tandem to achieve the desired results, much like a group of co-workers. Each one has their own specialty, but it's only together that they can get the results that everyone wants. So how does Riley cope with only a partial set? How was the first day of school? She's probing us. I'm done. You pretend to be Joy. What? Okay. Um, hmm. It was fine, I guess. I don't know. Boo! I'll be Joy. School was great, all right? Riley, is everything okay? Oh. Like a teenager, or a sociopath. Same thing, really. She suddenly lacks the ability to connect with others on an emotional level, making her feel social isolation even as others try to interact with her. If she stays in the state for very long, her life will fly off the rails for good. So it's important that her rogue emotions and memories find their way back to headquarters. Where did joy and sadness end up? I will take you, but not you. Oh, who am I kidding? I can't leave you. Hello! Ah. Wait, hey! Chasing a pink elephant through long-term memory storage. That's Bing Bong, by the way. Riley's imaginary friend from way back when. And it's kind of surprising how big a role he plays in the film. So, let's bring in the DM to discuss how important Bing Bong really is. Good form. Uh, uh, yeah, just uh, to get my workout in here. I'm my partner, Bacchus Jr. He does have his father's punchability. But if you have a minute, can you tell me what you think of Bing Bong from Inside Out? Of course I'm going to talk about the pink elephant. He is, after all, the most well-developed character in the entire movie. Bing Bong represents the imaginary friend of the protagonist. Yet he shows more shades of humanity than any other character in the film. He's the most human one we get to see, and he's not even in for that long. What? No, no, no. See, Riley's the one we see the inner process of throughout the entire film. No! No, what we see is the emotional knee-jerk reaction of a preteen. One that hasn't experienced complex emotions yet. Okay, so the film does simplify emotional processing a touch. So, sh they turn human beings into simple reactionary devices with only five speeds, and eventually that gets down to one. I, I think those cat and dog emotions were done as a joke, honestly. And if that wasn't insulting enough, they decided to take it one step further and say that she can't even, you know, be herself without her core memories. 
people are a product of their experiences and memories. Without those to fall back on, what would we be? A blank slate. Counterpoint. Memento. Despite Guy Pierce's character having no memory due to a head injury suffered before the film starts, he still processes information in a way unique to him, giving him a depth that people have analyzed and even villainized over the years. All this from someone with arguably no core memories. Check and mate. So you're saying that Bing Bong is the deepest character? By far. He has his role to fulfill as a happy-go-lucky friend of Riley, but it's been many years since she's thought about him. He's stockpiling memories that her brain's trying to forget, showing sentimentality. Itself a mix of happiness and sadness, you know, the end goal emotion of the film. That's where Bing Bong starts. Well, that's true, but... He goes through the five stages of dying relatively quickly, which ultimately allows him to make the heroic sacrifice to save the ones that were trying to forget about him. There's six brain levels of emotion right there, if I ever heard any. I mean, the main character came even close to having that kind of emotional depth, then this movie would be a masterpiece. As it stands, it's just a, you know, silly movie that insults you on how emotional complexity works. And yet the amount of people who accept this film's portrayal of emotions means that they do identify with it. Implying that characters are driven by one emotion at any given point in time is... That's not, that's not good character writing, that's just bad NPC writing. I mean, a world that is like that would be Ni Hao Kai Lan. That's an appropriate comparison, because Inside Out was also made for children. It doesn't go into complex feelings like envy, spite, or effervescence because it's a rudimentary tool that kids can use to understand why their feelings sometimes control them. If this movie helps even a fraction of children become more aware of their own emotional health, then it's a good thing. Just had to play Beyond Checkmate, didn't you? Only because it was premature. But you did highlight why Bing Bong is a surprise breakout character of the film. Thanks for illustrating that, DM. No problem. Now if you excuse me. Gotta get back to it. Oh, by the way, took away your stuff. This is man, don't get my stuff back. Their path through the brain weaves back and forth, including trips to abstract thought, imagination land, and the realm of nightmares. Clown-shaped nightmares. Did you say birthday? <laughs> birthday? Oh, I swear, if Disney decided to do horror movies, they would be unrivaled. How many people have they killed again? can't be right. She did not mess around. The path plots a logical course for the film, including an attempt to ride the train of thought back to headquarters. I mean, that's certainly how fragile thought feels at times, but I'm not sure if this is somewhat accurate or totally Disney-fied. That's one shortfall of sociology. We study the external results, not the internal process. So I guess I better call him before he angrily appears. Come in, psycho. Are you there? That's where officer is dressing my eyes. Oh, hi, Sosh. Beckus? How's it going? Where's psycho? He left a note. He said that he was running for his life. From what? Hands. He really don't like hands. Psycho finally snapped. I always knew this day would happen. So, what brings you by? Oh, I was gonna ask him how accurate the psychological structure of Inside Out was, but... Oh, surprisingly, they done really good. While it does make everyone's mind into this bright, colorful mess, those writers did do their research for a long time on it. The first dozen drafts of the script were way darker than a kid's film should be, so what you see is the best they could do without scaring all the children. Or scarring them. Why is there only one letter difference between the two of them anyway? Anyway, yes, it is a little simple, but the principles are all solid and pretty accurate in the broad strokes. We won't give you a doctorate after watching it, but what movie does? Aside from that one Kelvin made. But that was a really long movie. Who are you? Oh, Oz Baggis Tag to Bracket Tag. How you doing? How do you know so much about this? I was a Disney fan. I watch all the special features. The biggest compromise in they did between truth and film is simplifying emotions. They take all that complexity and air it down to five things. That's no easy task, but it worked well. But the only thing they did wrong is that they made it look like Riley had no choice. Well, she didn't. Joy and sadness left the building, so it's just anger, fear, and disgust that she has to react with. No, man, she's just reacting with emotions she's not used to leaning on. Hear me out. Joy is the first emotion she experienced, according to the film. 
Next is sadness. Those two came first. Do you think that's the same for everyone? Th that does seem like the most likely explanation. And for what depth of knowledge do you speak? You been inside a baby's head lately? Did you just make a being John Malkovich reference? The what? Never mind. Today's strange enough. Riley's key emotions are joy and sadness, since she tries to inspire joy and feels sad when she fails to. She chose joy as her plump man, shaping the rest of her emotions around making happiness for herself and others. That's why she's so lost when her yin and yang balance is gone. She's living only with fear, disgust, and anger. She don't know how to do that. She ain't out any practice with it. Interesting theory. But what proof do you have that that's how emotions work in the film's universe? Her parents. Let's go back to that dinner scene. Did you guys pick up on that? Uh -huh. Sure mm -hmm. did. Something's wrong. Should we ask her? Do you see what I see in the head? All of her emotions are sadness. It's kind of depressing. Nah, nah, they ain't all blue, but I did let them die. They is happy, sad, 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 disgust, sad, angry, sad, fear, sad. All of it is sadness because she chose sadness as her default worldview. That doesn't mean she's sad all the time, just means she has shared a sadness to everything. See, the father chose the same, with anger clones of different colors. It's played for laughs, but what if he chose to have this anger shape his emotional state long ago? And what we're seeing is the outcome. The default emotion become the universal outlook. Riley's a different person without joy and sadness because she doesn't have her go-to guys. And if she kept doing that happy, happy, joy, joy focus into adulthood, they all turn into joy. She would never accept sadness as something she has to accept. She would become emotionally focused. A lot of adults do that. It's a lot easier that way. That strangely makes sense. Why is that strange? Just because someone looks sad all the time doesn't mean that's all they can feel, right? We got some emotions in here. They got range. The face, the inside, you know, we can fake it. Or we can feel it. Whichever one we want to do. Where did you learn this? I watch things. I also feel things. It's pretty easy if you don't overthink it. Yeah, I have no idea what that's like. Thanks for your input, Bacchus. You're welcome. Now, I was gonna get me some more shut eye. I really need to get me a pillow. The writers of this film really added depth beyond what people first assumed. What could have been the equivalent of a bad TV series telling children how to handle their emotions turned into a somewhat realistic take on how confusing our limbic responses can be during times of stress. The trauma of a move has been the plot to many films starring children, but this one lets us peer into the inner process and really makes us understand why having good emotional health is crucial to surviving this time of upheaval. So back to my initial question. Which does this film do more, inform or entertain? It won't enlighten anyone who's made it through puberty because it deals mostly with simple one-gear emotions. However, like all good children's films, it has moments the adults will laugh at while relating to its short target demographic. It entertains both and informs those who could use some guidance going into the minefield known as adolescence. So the movie succeeded at what it aimed to do, get people to watch it and recommend it to others. Is that a great film? That's debatable. Will people use this to teach their children about emotions? That's almost guaranteed. So, for better or worse, Inside Out has left its mark, and deservedly so. When you consider the thousands of ways this concept could have gone wrong, it's a miracle that this film actually found the best path possible. It gives us characters we can relate to, situations many of us have dealt with, and the logical mechanics to explain how our minds sort themselves out. It may not be perfect, but neither are people. We don't always make sense, but we try to sort our mess as best we can while living in the real world. And I feel like Inside Out is reflecting that. It tries hard and actually succeeds, despite tripping over itself constantly, like we all do. And that makes it beautiful. I'm Socio, and I feel happy to be back. When I'm on the outside, I'm looking at I can see through you, see your true colors inside you. He's the most human one we get to see, and he's not even in it that long. I liked it, but the pauses were huge. <laughs> you can shorten them up. I can, yes, in post. Yeah. I can fix it in post, just like Manos. Yeah, that movie was amazing after post. <laughs> I want to see that movie pre-post. <laughs> <laughs> I want to 
know what they cut out! <laughs> Did they cut out? Uh, cutting room floor is amazingly clean on this one. 